The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 15275 in the name of Margaret McCulloch on International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if the members who would like to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Margaret McCulloch to open the debate. Seven minutes or so, please, Ms McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. In opening this debate this afternoon, I want to thank all those members who have supported the motion before us and allowed me to bring the issue of female genital mutilation to the Chamber. I also want to thank all those organisations and activists who have committed so much of their time to raising awareness of FGM, not just with the wider public and in frontline services, but with members, ministers, researchers and staff here in this Parliament. I am pleased that some of those people have joined us from the public gallery. This might be the last opportunity we have to debate FGM in a plenary session, but it is certainly not the first time the Parliament has addressed the issue. Through members' debates, government's debates, parliamentary questions and committee sessions, a number of members from across the whole Parliament have taken an interest in this important issue. Kenny Gibson, Christina McKelvey, Jenny Mara and Patricia Ferguson, to name but a few. In this session in particular, there has been a renewed focus on the issues surrounding FGM and welcome progress towards the prevention and elimination of this appalling form of discrimination. In the past few days, people throughout the country and around the world observed International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. From policy makers and parliaments and assemblies like this, to those working on the front line in countries where there is a practising population, to activists and agitators worldwide campaigning for change. It was a day for reflection, to think of victims, to commemorate those who have been excluded, injured or even killed due to the ignorance and equality that lies behind FGM. It was a day for education, to raise awareness so the world can know that what this injustice is and why it must be stopped. But most importantly, it was a day for action, to say no more, to put forward solutions and to galvanise the work of charities, activists, NGOs and governments in a drive to end this form of abuse. FGM is an extreme form of gender-based discrimination an act of violence against women and girls, a violation of their bodies and a violation of their human rights. UNICEF estimate that there are over 120 million women and girls living with the consequences of FGM worldwide, mainly in 29 African countries where the practising population is high and also in areas like Kurdistan, Iraq and Egypt. The World Health Organization placed that figure at around 140 million, and the most recent UN figures suggest it could be even as high as 200 million. Mass migration and cross-border travel brings opportunities to our society, but it also means that policymakers here must confront unfamiliar challenges from other cult cultures such as FGM. For clarity, FGM is a form of abuse in which women and girls' genitals are injured and altered for non-medical reasons. And that's an important point. There is no medical justification for female genital mutilation, nor does FGM have any basis in religion. It's a cultural practice rooted in patriarchy and gender inequality. In some cultures, FGM is seen as a prerequisite for marriage, a way of preserving a girl's chastity before marriage and a woman's faithfulness afterwards. The pressure to undergo FGM is society, in societies in which marriage is a means of finding social acceptance and economic security can be severe. The stigma of not having undergone FGM can be overwhelming. In meetings I held my capacity as convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, I heard about young girls who had resisted being, being cut, being forced into the most extreme and disturbing forms of FGM by those closest to them. And that's another important point. There are different forms of FGM. The World Health Organisation recognises four categories. 
Type 1 mainly involves the partial or total removal of the clitoris. Type 2 excision again involves partial or total removal of the clitoris as well as a partial or total removal of the labour or labia. Sorry. Type 3 infibulation involves narrowing the orifice and creating a seal by cutting and repositioning the labia with or without cutting the clitoris. And type 4 covers all other procedures including pricking and burning and some of the most extreme and disturbing forms of FGM. Needless to say, there are no health benefits in any of these procedures, only serves to injure and to harm. Victims can experience pain, bleeding, shock, infection and longer term abscesses, cysts, adhesions and neuromas. Type 3 FGM can cause further complications such as reproductive tract infections and incontinence. Many of the women who are cut experience chronic pain, recurring infections for the rest of their lives, depression and post-traumatic stress. The death rate amongst babies during, during and immediately after childbirth are higher for those born to mothers who had undergone some kind of FGM. Presiding officer, three million women and girls are cut every year. It has to stop. The Scottish Government have now launched a national action plan for FGM, setting out the steps the Government, its agencies and its partners can take to prevent and hopefully eradicate this form of abuse. It comes in the wake of Equally Safe, the joint strategy with COSLA on the prevention and elimination of violence against women. Doing more to raise awareness, to support the organisation, organisations who work with victims and to train health and social work professionals to spot the signs of FGM could be transformative for those who are at risk or have undergone FGM and need support. But we also need to reach out to those who are suffering and those who are at risk in other countries. We, the challenge of FGM is a global one. We cannot rise to the challenge as one nation, but as part of an international community. Presiding officer, nobody should have to endure this abuse. We must do all we can to close the gap between the world we have, in which millions are cut every year, and the world we want, in which FGM is a thing of the past. No injustice can last forever. As pernicious as this inequality is, I believe that when words become deeds and ideas lead to action, change will come. This generation can and must F end FGM. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. And I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Presiding officer, I'd like to congratulate Margaret McCulloch for securing tonight's debate on an issue which, as Margaret McCulloch pointed out in her opening, is one I've long been concerned about. Indeed, nearly 15 years ago, I lodged a motion condemning female genital mutilation, and I'm shocked and horrified that it continues across the globe on such a vast scale, as Margaret McCulloch eh, pointed out. FGM is clearly a fundamental violation of human rights, along with the trauma and pain it puts young women through. The lasting effects of FGM can include cysts and fertility infections, as well as increased risk of newborn deaths due to complication with childbirth. Additionally, in certain instances, the procedure has been known to cause death, and obviously psychological problems and depression can also follow when one considers that this is often inflicted on women by their closest relatives, people who they have known and trusted all their lives. FGM is a sign of deep-rooted inequality between the sexes and the societies in which it is practised and is an example of great misogyny and discrimination against girls and women. FGM is often done in certain cultures to stop women from having sex outside of marriage and keep them uh, pure for their husbands, a double standard that is, of course, not practised or expected from the men uh, who belong to such patriarchal societies. It has been said by Police Scotland that, and I quote, FGM is a social convention, and the social pressure to conform to what others do and have been doing is a strong motivation to perpetuate the practice. Since that practice is almost always carried out in girls, this practice is a violation not only of human rights, but also the rights of children. And the violation these girls and women are put through is a horror that we must vigorously oppose and educate against. Since 1985, Scotland has banned the practice of FGM and created policies to stop the further spread of abuse 
among those minority communities in which it is commonplace in their own countries. Such abuse will result in the prosecution of anyone who performs or tries to coerce a young girl into having a procedure performed on them. For example, a father or grandfather can be tried in court for strongly encouraging a young girl to receive the procedure, even though he may not have performed the procedure himself. There must be zero tolerance of such practices. We cannot be seen to have any form of a soft stance in this matter. The trauma that millions of girls and women all over the world have to endure is quite simply unimaginable. Having days such as the International Day of Zero Tolerance Female Genital Mutilation, which took place four days ago, allows Scotland and countries from across the globe to unite, ensuring we will not allow this abhorrent practice to continue. Often women or girls who have gone through this horrific torture feel too scared or ashamed to speak out about the terror they faced, as they face pressure from within their cultural group to remain silent and often feel the stigma that could be attached to them by those who do not share their cultural identity. International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation is therefore also time to make clear that the people who have been through such torture can find a safe place here in Scotland. I applaud the efforts of various charities throughout Scotland to provide support and training for victims. For example, Rape Crisis Glasgow, who thanked the Scottish Government for providing assistance to survivors of FGM, and just this past week set up a group that already helps at least 10 women. Isabel Kerr, manager at Rape Crisis Glasgow, said, and I quote, this is giving women the chance to come together and support each other and has also given us a chance to work with the women, women on building confidence and self-esteem on their health and well-being and on managing the symptoms of their, trauma, of their trauma. I echo uh, Presiding Officer Margaret McCulloch in hoping that we can all live to see a world in which this extreme form of discrimination against women and girls is eradicated once and for all. I have a mother, a wife, a daughter and a sister and I could not possibly imagine such horrors uh, um, happening to any of them. I hope we can continue to have a Scotland where prevention, protection and service and support are provided to all victims of FGM within Scotland. Yeah. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Annabel Goulding. Presenting officer, I commend uh, Margaret McCulloch on taking this opportunity to mark the International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM, a practice that infringes the basic human rights and health of women across the world. This cruel practice, which is often carried out with crude tools and without anaesthetic, has no basis in medical necessity, but is embedded in a long-standing cultural system that is deeply patriarchal. As such, in seeking to intervene and change attitudes within communities where the practice is present, we must ensure that any Scottish action plan takes a consultative approach, engaging with knowledgeable charities and community leaders as much as possible. Only through working with communities will we will be able to identify where this most violent and cruel form of repression is pre prevalent, raising awareness and punishing perpetrators. All women have a human right to feel safe within their families and safe as part of society as a whole. Safety means equality, security and absolute freedom over their own bodies and well-being. The equally safe strategy encapsulates these rights and shows how policies can be put in place to tackle all forms of violence, repression and abuse of women. FGM is included, but in light of reports both here and throughout the United Kingdom, it is only right that we as a parliament look to develop a more targeted and long-term action plan, and I welcome the publication of the draft for consultation last week. This will look to both prevent future mutilation by protecting young girls who are at risk, while also seeking to provide accessible and anonymous support for women who are trying to survive with physical and mental scars. One such survivor, Nimco Ali, was cut as a seven-year-old while on holiday in Djibouti on the Horn of Africa and set up the Daughters of Eve charity, which works to protect women from FGM. She shared her experience in advance of Zuda Tolerance Day. FGM, she said, is a brutal practice, but it is also a very simple one to end. If you stop one woman having FGM done to her, then you break that link and prevent it being done to the next generation. I came from a family that was 100% FGM, and that has gone down to zero in a generation. It is something that can be ended. We are finally shaking the taboo of FGM, but we have to be vigilant and cannot be complacent. Ms. Ali wants FGM to be discussed as part of mandatory sexual and relationship education classes at schools in England. I don't see why Scotland uh, should be any different, and we'd welcome the Minister's comment on that. 
Children of all backgrounds have the capacity to break this cycle, and their awareness and support of classmates can help to change that cruel cultural norm. As the draft action plan states, FGM will continue to be a problem in Scotland until communities themselves choose to abandon the practice. And we recognise that in order to find a solution to eradicate FGM, working with potentially affected communities is vital to breaking the cycle of violence. I pay tribute to those organisations with work those, with those communities in Scotland to achieve eradication. The Scottish Refugee Council report tackling FGM in Scotland towards a Scottish model of intervention looked at existing census data and sought to provide an albeit limited picture of the extent of risk to communities living here now. The findings are highlighted in the draft action plan. There are approximately 24,000 men, women and children living in Scotland born in a country affected by FGM to some extent. There are communities potentially affected by FGM living in every Scottish local authority area, with the largest being in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Dundee, respectively. And 2,750 girls were born in Scotland to mothers born in an FGM practising country between 2001 and 2012. That is the scale of the potential problem, but we can eradicate FGM in Scotland by taking a consultative approach that is mindful of the many cultural factors I have mentioned. No woman should feel at risk and no child should feel that they are powerless over their own body. Such abuse can never be tolerated and should never be the norm for any community. The equality and human rights of all womankind demand that all nations stand as one against this cruel practice on zero tolerance and every other day. Many thanks. I now call Annabel Goldie to be followed by John Mason. Deputy Presiding Officer, I am very pleased to contribute to this debate marking the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital uh, Mutilation. And I too pay tribute to Margaret McCulloch for securing the parliamentary time for both this important and deeply disturbing issue. Originally an African-led movement, awareness of FGM has greatly increased in recent years thanks to the tireless efforts of campaigners such as those to whom Malcolm Chisholm referred. And they have brought this hidden horror out of the shadows because the horrific experience which is FGM with all the psychological and physical aftershocks um, will reverberate from many girls from adolescence through to adulthood. And understandably, girls and women, shamed by the stigma and traumatised into silence by what has happened to them, are often reluctant to speak out about their ordeals. But some survivors have shared their experiences, and these experiences shake you to the very core. Girls in their infancy, trusting, unknowing, and unable to defend themselves, are typically circumcised with a range of implements without anaesthesia, in an unsterile environment, and with no appropriate aftercare. Some girls bleed to death, others are left with debilitating pain and complications that will afflict them for the rest of their lives. Their parents can be complicit in this so-called rite of passage, but others have no idea what their daughters have been subjected to. The perpetrator is often someone in a position of trust within the family or local community, someone a child would not instinctively fear. And victims are reassured with meaningless platitudes of favourable prospects and promises of good husbands. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, this practice is not a rite of passage. On the contrary, it is a gross violation of human rights and of the very essence of womanhood. A woman in the UK is barbarically cut every 96 minutes, but the real situation is feared to be much worse. This is a silent and often unreported crime, so we must assume that the figure is considerably higher. I applaud both the UK and the Scottish governments for their efforts and initiatives to eliminate this horrendous practice in our home nations. And it is my sincere hope that we can build on this momentum in the months and years to come. Figures from UNICEF show that the scale of FGM across the globe is much worse than international organisations first thought. Previously, it was estimated that 125 million girls worldwide had been cut, but UNICEF has disclosed in just the past few days that this number is shockingly higher, closer to 200 million. And UNICEF also warns that with increasing population growth, the number of girls and women undergoing FGM will rise significantly over 
the next 15 years, and that is an appalling prospect. Mali musician and FGM survivor Inna Moja bravely shared her experience of cutting in its aftermath with the United Nations last Saturday. And she said, and I'm quoting, I felt that I would never become a woman because I had something missing and I wasn't worth it. It took a lot away from what I could achieve as a teenager and what I could realize as a teenager. So I lost my identity when I went through FGM. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how strong I could be because cutting me was telling me that I'm not good enough. FGM dates back to antiquity. Millions upon millions of women have been subjected to it, suffered from it, and have been devalued by it. And we now have an opportunity to empower and protect not just a new generation of women, but their children and their children's children. And Deputy Presiding Officer, this is our call to action. So let's unite to end a barbaric anachronism. And in doing so, let us give hope to women, to their daughters, and to the unborn girls of the future. Many thanks. I now call John Mason to be followed by John <coughs> Finney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you also to uh, Margaret McCulloch uh, for securing uh, this debate. The Equal Opportunities Committee was very keen uh, that we should have a debate, although there was not normal committee time. And I think most of us are speaking in this debate. Uh, I know Sandra White apologises for not being here. She had another commitment uh, that she couldn't get out of. Now, I confess this is not the easiest topic to speak on. However, I do believe we have a duty to speak about it. And specifically, I think those of us who are men have a duty to speak about it and not claim that we have no responsibility. One of the main facts we have learned on the committee is that it's very difficult to find out the facts of what is actually happening in Scotland today. In the past, we would have assumed that FGM was mainly restricted to the 29 or so countries where it is most commonly practised. And perhaps on top of that, eh, to the additional countries where a significant minority had migrated. In the past, that would not have included Scotland to any real extent, but things have changed. Here in Scotland, we have a much more diverse population than we used to do, and I very much welcome that. We gain from a whole variety of new Scots, eh, including, in my experience, African Christians, eh, being involved in churches and bringing a real enthusiasm. But alongside all that positive input from other cultures, there can be more negative practices appearing, and FGM is certainly one of these. In Scotland's National Action Plan, eh, the wording on pages 11 and 12 is couched very carefully and wisely eh, under FGM in the Scottish context. I'll just quote from there. There are no clear and robust figures for the prevalence of FGM in Scotland because of the hidden nature of the crime in its report. Tackling FGM in Scotland towards a Scottish model of intervention, the Scottish Refugee Council analysed data, I missed some of the words, the report did not seek to determine prevalence of FGM, but rather found that there were 23,979 men, women and children born in one of the 29 countries identified by UNICEF 2013 as an FGM practising country now living in Scotland in 2011. And it also says 2,750 girls were born in Scotland to mothers born in an FGM practising country between 2001 and 2012. This was very much the line from witnesses that the committee heard from in our evidence sessions. However, we did also hear uh, from some working in this sector that they are virtually certain that cutting is being carried out in Glasgow and Edinburgh at least. Perhaps more common is the tendency for girls to be taken back by their families to the country of their roots for the procedure to be carried out there, with the parents often being under considerable family pressure. Clearly, legislation is part of the answer in tackling this, but we also heard of innovative ways of approaching it. For example, by attempting to get the parents to sign a certificate, promising not to allow FGM to be carried out on their daughters. Now, this might have no legal weight, but it can make a difference to the parents' own attitude and can strengthen their resolve when under pressure from extended family. Last Tuesday, we had a very useful event hosted by the committee at which Margaret McCulloch, Alec Neill, and representatives of some of those tackling the issue spoke. As always, it was particularly moving to hear from survivors of FGM speaking about some of their personal experiences. And I found it helpful to hear from a young guy from an African background 
who perhaps unusually had it discussed with him by his mother and has since become passionate on educating his peers who come from a similar background. I think it's useful to emphasise at this point too, which Margaret McCulloch also referenced, uh, the FGM is, quote, a cultural practice which does not have any basis in religion. And so from that point, it's clear there's a huge difference between FGM and male circumcision. The two are not comparable, and there are both health and religious arguments for male circumcision which are not replicated for FGM. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate. The committee unanimously felt that we would uh, like to raise it in the chamber. Uh, and uh, my hope is that going forward, both the Parliament and the Government will continue to treat FGM with the seriousness it deserves. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call John Finney to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I join with others in congratulating Margaret McCulloch uh, for holding this debate here and recognise our commitment to the issue, and indeed many others, Kenny Gibson, others who have been mentioned, and also the Scottish Refugee Council who contributed to the debate we've had. Now, I, I think there's a great importance in international days. I think it's a good way of highlighting issues, and with, as Annabel Goldie said, with 200 million women affected across the, the world, well, then this is certainly needed in highlighting. What we do know is that many problems can be resolved by a gradualist approach. That's not the case with this issue. Zero tolerance is the, the, the only way that we can deal with this. And I look forward to the day, certainly, when society reflects on this vile practice as being a total aberration. In the meantime, what we are dealing with is a, a violation of human rights. And I'm always keen that we take a rights-based approach. And that's certainly the case when... Uh, and, and as has been said many times, there's often very difficult things to talk about when you're talking about injuring genitals as Margaret McCulloch said, extreme and disturbing uh, um, behaviour. Um, and this is, uh, this is violence against uh, women and girls. This is gender inequality. And I'm delighted that the action plan, Scotland's national action plan, is in place. And I think it's important the Scottish Government works with COSLA on that. That's because the public service workers are often at the front line of how we can address this issue, and not exclusively, but of course significantly among those are medical staff. It is about pre prevention, protection, providing services and support, the action plan. And Malcolm Chisholm is entirely right to say that is isn't an issue for Scotland, it isn't an issue for the UK, it isn't an issue for the EU, it's an issue for the world to, to deal with. Um, and something that jumped out at me in relation to the action plan was the proposal that there be access to informed mental health services. Because there's a veil of secrecy around this whole issue, there's mystery around it. And uh, as my late mother would say, you only know what you know. And it's very challenging for people to understand all the different aspects of this. So the, uh, as someone said, living with the consequences of this, the mental health impact is important. The practitioner who's dealing with that absolutely understands what's involved. So um, we must deal with that um, significant breach of trust. And we heard terms, euphemisms such as children being taken on holiday. Um, and that's, that's a significant thing in, in a family relationship if people feel there's a breach of trust there in the years ahead. So as has been said, I think there's a great deal of discomfort reading and listening about this, um, let alone discussing it, but we must. I'd also say that it's, and it wouldn't surprise anyone to hear me say this, I say it in relation to a, a number of issues, that's not exclusively an urban issue either. I know no one is saying that. There is the density of population that can mean that services are there, but support must be provided around the country, not least because we know there are challenges for ethnic minority um, individuals living in rural communities. Now, we know that the, aim is, the overall aim of the strategy is to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, and that's at the key of this, because this is about power. This is about abusive relationship. And we know, as has been said, that this wouldn't be happening to men. This, would have, this, this just is... Um, gender-based violence. So there's an important role, as has been said, for males. I, I applaud, as an MSP, like many others here, we have the great privilege to meet people. And it's been a real privilege to meet the, the, the survivors uh, and hear their courage in the manner in which they've spoken. I have to say, I found it very humbling. So I think that we must, first and foremost, ensure that respect for every individual. We must have a rights abates based approach to everything. Um, this abuse must end. So let's all fight together for the eradication of FGM. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And to now call Christian Allard. Thank you very much, President Officer. And as a member of the Equal Opportunity uh, Committee, I, I would like to, uh, uh, to repeat the words of, of John Finney. Uh, it's been very much a privilege to be involved uh, in the debate and in the progress of the Scottish Government is doing and uh, all the third sector organisations are doing uh, to, to tackle uh, this, uh, this problem. And I thank again 
Margaret Macker to bring that debate to Parliament is so important that we got it here. But of course, we had a debate last year. And in February last year, we debated a motion from the Scottish Government about International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. The Cabinet Secretary then, Alex Neil, talked about the Scottish Government's commitment to fund a programme of work to tackle fem uh, female genital mutilation in Scotland and protect those women and girls of risk at risk of harm from this human rights abuse. I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary launched the action plan uh, last week. And in my contribution to the debate last year, I did say that this is uh, this unacceptable and illegal practice uh, should not be called by its abbreviation FGM. Uh, and I did encourage at the time everyone to use this full name, female genital mutilation, because it's uh, what it says and it's so important. And I would like maybe the minister uh, to reflect into this uh, on, 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 on what we write and, and what we say. Another point I developed last year was the role of men in communities where female genital mutilation is a reality. Uh, I said then that men must not be excluded from, uh, uh, from, from this issue, but be seen as part of the solution to end this unacceptable and illegal practice. And I'm delighted that one year on, as the fantastic work of the project My Voice has really understood the role of men. Uh, let me read the flyers, uh, uh, inviting people to participate to the project. Are you a man who is from a community or ethnic group potentially affected by female genital mutilation or cutting or by female circumcision? Uh, are you living in Scotland? Uh, we would love uh, you to get involved in a new project we are starting called My Voice. And that project is so, so important. It's been uh, with the support of the Scottish Government and collaboration with the Internet Research Forum, Roshni, and the Institute for International Health and Development at Queen Margaret University. And I would encourage the Minister uh, to, to, to look at the research. I know we are a bit late, but I would love the research to be published after the election, but not in a period of perda, just to make sure it gets all uh, the, the, the coverage that it should get. And we understood from the outset it's crucial to work with men to develop services and support for communities affected by uh, female genital mutilation. John Mason uh, talked about the event which was organized by the uh, uh, committee, by the Equal Opportunities Committee, a fantastic event la uh, uh, last week. And uh, uh, the young guy, as he called it, uh, Oye Debo uh, Ola Leken, was really, really inspirational. He really told us how important is the role of fathers the role of son and husband who have no idea at all of what is happening. That culture which maybe like Ken Gibson said earlier was maybe a patriarchal kind of idea at the start and now very much uh, the men are very much isolated from it and don't, they don't realize uh, in the modern day what, what's happening uh, to, to women. So uh, this action plan talk about uh, including men, women and young people but I, I will again encourage the minister to make sure that men are maybe be seen as a key a solution to that problem. And, and that young uh, uh, man, Ayodepo, was really fantastic and very inspirational. And to conclude, uh, I would like to, to talk about uh, a point, an historic point, about some, uh, some of the contributions said about a problem from other cu cultures and other countries. I, I, let me read from the Medical Times and Gazette that the performance of clitoridectomy on a woman without a knowledge and consent is an offence against medical ethics need not to be said. We suspect it is amenable to the criminal law of the land. This article was written in London in April 1867, denouncing a practice that was wrongly claimed to treat many conditions, menstrual pains, bladder problems, epilepsy, insanity, spinal irritation, masturbation, and even lesbianism. I did not end there. In the American Journal of Clinical Medicine, half a century later, in June 1915, we can read that circumcision in the female is necessary with guidance how to perform it in 1915. We know that the practice in the US survived over 50 years and stopped only in the 60s, in 1960s. Why Christian women in America alive today have been mutilated? That, that way. So, you know, when Kane Gibson talk about, I would not want my, 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 my mother or, or, or my wife to be involved with that, maybe your grandmother was, maybe your great grandmother was. And, and it's something we, we have to understand. If you want to understand, uh, we have to understand the past before we pass judgment on other cultures, of other cultures today, because here in Scotland, only since 1985, is female genital mutilation a criminal offense. We should know about our history of female genital mutilation to better understand what is happening 
happening today. Let boys and girls, men and women, let them know about the reality and the horror of female genital mutilation, and let's eradicate it together. Presenting officer. Many thanks. Can I now invite Marco Biaggi to wind up, please? And, uh, Minister, you have seven minutes or so. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are some battles that constantly have to be refought. They seem to re-emerge each generation. And uh, you know, I, I was going to begin by remarking about the, the illegality in 1985 and the closing the loophole in 2015, separated by 30 years, and the need to still have this debate, to still have this action, to produce this action plan. And yet, here is Christian Allard suggesting and indeed quoting about this issue having been raised and having been dealt with, having been argued over uh, going back such a, such a longer period. Um, that we are here, that we have got quite as far as we have in exposing the issue, that we have an international day is a testimony to everybody who is working out there in communities around Scotland, internationally and in here in the chamber to continue to highlight it. And uh, Margaret McCulloch paid tribute to many members who have done this over some time. Margaret McCulloch was right to place this in the context of gender violence. This is a form of structural gender violence through the, the way that expectations are placed in those societies and cultures and the things that are demanded. It isn't tied to religion, although <coughs> sadly there are those who do seek to quote religion falsely to justify it. It's not tied to a particular continent or even a region and even within the countries, yes, 29 that John Mason uh, quotes, there are localised differences. It is simply a practice that is the uh, manifestation of gender violence in particular societies and cultures and gender violence wherever it takes place is not acceptable. It is also often carried out by close friends, people even who gain status as a result of their activity. The accounts that I've read on this, they tell of the, the pressure that is involved to not just to undergo female genital mutilation, but to perpetrate it, to support your relatives to undergo the experience. Uh, you can say that's complicit, but those people too are coming under great threat, great forms of oppression, and are being forced to do things by a uh, cultural practice that should have been binned a long time ago. Those who aren't are stigmatised. They're seen as unclean. Words like that are common in accounts. And uh, those, who, uh, those who reject FGM, female genital mutilation, are often treated less favourably as a result. Those that do suffer it undergo health problems that are often lifelong. And yet, what is terrifying is that in some cases it's not even recognised as a practice. The, word, the, the phrase FGM is unfamiliar to many. It has become, in those communities where it still continues, so normalised that it seems to be just a natural part of the growing up process. That is a really deep challenge for anybody to try and deal with that in an ingrained way. Because if you look back to those efforts, um, the exposition of this issue 100 years ago, then we can be sure that that fell far away from anything that could be described as culturally sensitive. And it is an ever-present danger that those most at risk are pushed further away by our uh, good-intentioned attempts to help them. Malcolm Chisholm identified the importance of partnership and sensitivity, and I absolutely, totally agree. That has been the approach that we have been taking on the National Action Plan, reflecting that need to involve everybody. You know, when you're potentially asking people to criminalise their own families, this is going to be difficult and sensitive. The societal standards and attitudes can be best challenged often by people who are already inside those societies that are expressing that concern, who are showing leadership by supporting them to be champions for progress and reform. Last year, uh, in the, the debate, uh, in one of the debates that we've had here, I remember the issue, and indeed in the Equal Opportunities Committee, of which I'm also an alum, I remember the issue of the passport being raised that could be shown by 
uh, family members who had come under pressure to put their children forward, often abroad, uh, for the procedure, for the, for the mutilation. And it would be a card that would say, if you take, if you take me back, if, if you do this, you will, you, will, you will cause severe consequences for me. That sort of scheme is now operating in, uh, from Eng England and Scotland, and some of the early response from uh, England has been quite positive. But even though we are doing quite a lot on this issue, we do have to keep going forward. We have to keep refighting these battles, continue to support people in the ongoing challenge. That is why we have the National Action Plan. That is why we have identified further things we want to do. We need to redouble our efforts with frontline staff. And the Action Plan identifies that we will have our multi-agency national guidance soon, uh, early 2016, but th there is also a further stage beyond that to provide even further information so that people working at the front line can identify the signs. A new ICD code to clarify reporting, to make that whole awareness issue, to try and get that understanding of how many instances are happening uh, clearly into the system. A recommendation that all statutory agencies should have at least one named professional with expertise on FGM. And yes, um, to answer the point that Malcolm Chisholm had raised earlier, to consider legislation. We are looking at the provisions relating to female genital mutilation that have come into force in England and Wales and have commissioned a community-based organisation. Again, partnership being the key to consult with a cross-section of the communities to ascertain their views and to see what we can do. But even though there are, we haven't taken the approach of the mandatory duty uh, that is in legislation here, this is something that is a child protection issue, very clearly. It is covered by that legislation. It is covered by that work. And we want to continue supporting the organisations and the agencies across Scotland to deal with this, to support the champions for change in their own society. And we can look around, not just the work that has happened here, to continually draw this issue into the, the limelight, but also around the world where there are examples of great societal change, with Kenya having taken great action in particular. Our resolve is clear in this government. Our resolve is clear in this parliament. Our resolve is clear in this society. And indeed, around the world, resolve is growing. That is a good place to be in, and we will continue to work in partnership with everyone around this chamber and around the country to tackle the scourge of female genital mutilation. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes Margaret McCulloch's debate on International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.